Good evening. On behalf of the Developmental Psychology Division of the Hellenic Psychological Society, let me welcome you to this online talk as part of the series of talks and webinars organized by the division and the society more generally, aiming to help spreading scientific knowledge to both the academia as well as interested members of the society. So welcome. Allow me to especially thank Dr. Emma Blakey for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk on a topic within her field of expertise, that is cognitive development and the search of fruitful pathways towards its deeper understanding and efficient nurturing. Dr. Blakey is a developmental psychologist, a senior lecturer at the psychology department of the University of Sheffield and part of the Sheffield Cognitive Development Research Group. Her research focuses on how children develop high-level cognitive skills known as executive functions, attention, memory, and the ability to regulate behavior. She's interested in how this develop in toddlers and preschoolers, why we see individual differences in these skills, why these abilities may vary according to children's socioeconomic background, and how their development can be best supported. In the context of today's talk, Dr. Blakey will discuss how these core cognitive skills, executive functions, which support goal-directed thinking, develop over childhood and underpin school readiness and learning, and when disparities begin to emerge in their development. In the second part of the talk, Dr. Blakey will discuss how we might best foster and nurture their development, and what we need to do in order to narrow disparities in early cognitive development. As I'm sure you will yourself very soon realize, Dr. Blake is passionate about her job, that is learning through her research and teaching about children's development. She's also passionate about widening participation and enjoys engaging in opportunities to talk about her work with the public. So here we are today, Dr. Blakey, in such a context, looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to everybody that's joined today. It's an absolute pleasure and an honour to be able to give this talk um, for the Hellenic Developmental Psychology section. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about my research today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing any comments or feedback or questions that you might have. So um, as Lisa mentioned, the topic of my talk today is on understanding and supporting early cognitive development. Um, I'm really interested in trying to understand executive functions. These are key skills that develop in the early years and how they support other aspects of um, other important aspects of development and how we might be able to best support them. So just in terms of um, a summary of what I want to talk about today, um, in the first part of this talk, I'll talk about what executive functions are and some work that I did looking into early development and particularly the toddler years, which I think are really exciting, but also quite difficult. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk about why I think executive functions really matter and some work that we've been doing to try and understand the role that they play in school readiness. And then in part three, I'll talk about, given that executive functions are so important, how might we best support their development? And then I'll talk about the fact that I think we need more data to understand why disparities in development arise. And then I'll finish with some conclusions and broader issues that I think um, need to be considered in this area of research. So many of you here might already know what executive functions are, but just so that we're all on the same page, Executive function is um, often seen as this umbrella term that describes the collection of high level cognitive skills that really help us to regulate our attention, our thought and our action. And as adults, we have quite well developed executive function and we use these um, all of the time in many day to day activities from trying to multitask to trying to engage in a, in a conversation. And, and that's more difficult um, if you're in a group um, level situation where you're trying to have conversations with multiple people. Or even if you're going shopping and you're trying to remember the things that you need to buy. And every time you put something in your trolley, you're having to update that mental list in your head. But even though we've got quite well developed executive functions as adults, um, so executive functions develop quite slowly over the childhood years, by the time we're adults, um, they're quite well developed, we still might find ourselves um, struggling with executive functions from time to time. 
So particularly when we're tired or a little bit stressed, we might find ourselves accidentally pouring orange juice on our cereal instead of milk. We might find ourselves pushing doors, even though there's a big sign that says pull, we're just failing to monitor the context and update our behavior in a goal directed manner. We might catch ourselves blurting something out that we didn't mean to say, or even if we're just on autopilot, we might catch ourselves driving to work on a weekend when we meant to drive to the shops. So these kind of autopilot behaviours are kind of signature of not um, using our executive functions to engage in that goal directed thinking. And, and it can often happen when we're tired or stressed that this happens. But when we think about children, anyone that's been around a young child will know that they struggle sometimes with their behaviour. And again, like adults, particularly if they're a bit tired, but even more generally, they struggle to turn take they struggle to avoid temptations and they struggle to adapt their behavior in changing situations. So executive functions are known to develop quite slowly over the preschool years, but we do see significant developments in them during the preschool years. So between the ages, when I say preschool, I sort of mean between the ages of two and four years of age. And I've been really interested in the toddler years. Um, so I think toddlers are absolutely fascinating to study. Um, we know very little, actually, I think, about their cognitive development, particularly in terms of those high level cognitive skills. We know quite a bit now about toddler language development and that during the toddler years, language kind of explodes and children are learning vocabulary. They're, they're starting to engage in these conversations. But when we think about um, executive function development, actually, toddler, the toddlers have been known as this black box of development because they're really hard to study. And if we think about executive function tasks, they involve high level thought. Um, and the fact that toddlers um, often struggle with this, it can be a bit of a challenge. So these are my two children. I've got a one year old and a three year old. And they are just unpredictable. You know, when I think about my own kids, or if you've ever been around children, you'll know that young children are unpredictable. They move around a lot. They've got the motor skills to move around. So if we think about studying baby cognition, there's kind of some advantages there in that before they're crawling, they can sit down and maybe look and engage in certain tasks or, or do kind of reaching paradigms, but toddlers want to move around. Um, they also have, they're, they're starting to develop language, but they've not yet grasped enough language to often engage in tasks that have complex instructions and they have very limited attention. So it's a bit of a challenge when we're designing tasks that can be used with toddlers. But we know from just you know observing their everyday behavior that they are inflexible and that they often struggle to update their goals. And I think a really nice example of this is um, scale errors. Um, so these were studied by Judy Deloach in the US um, quite some time ago. And I think they offer a really nice illustration of this inflexible behavior. So Judy Deloach was looking at how children are able to flexibly update their use of playing with certain objects. And they brought toddlers into the lab, so two-year-olds, and they looked at how they played with certain things like this little girl here riding this car. And then interestingly, they gave them smaller mini versions of these same toys to see what they did. And they found that the children just tried to respond and play with these objects in the same way. So they didn't update their representation. They didn't respond to these objects in a flexible manner. So this little girl is just trying to climb into the car, even though it's impossible. So by just observing how children play at this age, we know that they struggle with being flexible. But how, how can we measure this in a systematic way with kind of systematic tools to look at accuracy and response times? Well, me and some colleagues at Sheffield have been trying to develop tasks to measure toddler executive function. Um, and we have came up with a task called the SWIFT, the Switching Inhibition and Flexibility Task. And we really like this task because it works well with toddlers. We've been using it from, from when children are about two years, four months, right up until they're four. And it involves a touchscreen computer where children are asked to sort different coloured shapes. And the way that we measure executive function is by getting them to play um, one particular game and sort objects by a particular rule, such as shape. And then they sort the objects by shape by pressing the one that matches the one at the top on a touchscreen computer. And then after several goes, maybe eight goes at sorting by shape, we ask them to switch and play a new game and they sort by colour. Um, and what we're interested in looking at is whether children are, are able to flexibly switch their attention and update their rule. 
And we've looked at this between the ages of two and four. And what we tend to find is that four year olds um, can easily switch rule. So they will sort by the new rule quite well. When the rule changes, they're able to flexibly adjust their attention and sort by the new rule. And they tend to be scoring pr pretty accurately when the rule changes. When we think about three-year-olds, they tend to perseverate. So when the rule changes, they just keep matching by the old rule. Um, they don't update their representation. They really struggle to be flexible. So if they sort by color, and then after several goes have to switch and sort by shape, they just continue to sort by color in quite a systematic way. So they get a score of um, zero. But interestingly, when we use this task with two-year-olds, we find quite an interesting pattern of performance. The two-year-olds are what we call mixed responders. So we find that they can sort by the first rule well. So if they're having to sort the shapes, for example, by color, they will sort by color. But then when the rule changes, they don't switch. They're not able to be flexible, but they also don't perseverate. They don't keep sorting by that first rule. They get about half right and half wrong in a really unsystematic fashion. So what's quite interesting here is that the two-year-olds are actually scoring more than the three-year-olds, even though their performance is unsystematic and it's not goal-directed. So what's quite interesting here is in, in prior research, perseveration was considered the starting point of development that young children would perseverate with the old rule and score zero. But we're actually finding that if we go below the age of three and look at early development, actually, although they're scoring higher, they're doing this in a really unsystematic way and there's an absence of goal-directed behavior. So just to kind of talk about that a little bit more, we think that perseveration, so getting it all wrong, seems to reflect children's memory beginning to develop. So if we think about a child that has been sorting by shape and then has to switch and sort by color, the children that are perseverating, they're just remembering that first rule so strongly and that's guiding their behaviour. So if we imagine that this girl is three and she's asked to sort by colour, she's just remembering what she did before and sorting by shape. And so systematically getting this wrong. But two-year-olds, we think they don't even have the memory representations to remember what they were doing before. So when they're asked to go from sorting by shape to colour, that shift in attention that's required is just too difficult and they neither can systematically sort correctly but they also can't systematically remember what they were doing before so they just perform in this mixed responding manner so what does this mean we think that four-year-olds are starting to develop quite strong flexible memory representations to guide their behavior we think that the three-year-olds are starting to, to develop strong memory representations, but they can't yet update these. They can't yet use these to engage in flexible behavior. And the two-year-olds, we think that they have a double whammy of very weak memory representations and also inflexible memory representations. So after studying the toddler years, um, although this has been really challenging and it's been really interesting coming up with tasks that, that we can use, we think that actually there's so much exciting change happening during this time when memory representations are starting to become more stable. And what's been quite interesting from this body of research, we found that executive functions, it's not necessarily that they're changing in a quantitative fashion, but actually there may be qualitative changes that, that are occurring during those early preschool years. So after telling you a little bit about executive functions in early development, I really want to move on now to talking about why I think executive functions matter. Um, Children vary a lot in their executive function skills. And, and for anyone that's been in a classroom environment um, and seeing the kind of massive variations in behavior in how children are able to attend and remember information and self-regulate and inhibit attention to distractions, we can see that there's a wide spectrum in these abilities. But does this matter? And why do children vary so much? And if it does matter, how can we support the development of executive functions and learning? Before I talk about the studies that we've done in this area, I just want to briefly touch on how we measure executive functions in preschoolers. So I talked a little bit already about measuring executive function in toddlers, so in two-year-olds. When we're working with three and four-year-olds, we tend to use a range of different tasks um, and we focus quite a lot on, on working memory or, or basic short-term memory and inhibitory control. So for example, to measure working memory, we might get children to remember different pictures, 
and then recall them in a backwards order. So they're having to recall something and, and process this and, and transform that representation to recall it in a backwards order. For more basic visual memory tasks, we might ask children to repeat a pattern or a sequence based on different objects that we tap. So this could be um, as in the Corsi block task, different colored cubes or actual real objects. And for inhibitory control, we're asking children to suppress a prepotent response. So with the peg tapping task, we might ask children to tap twice on the table if the experimenter taps once or tap um, once if the experimenter taps twice. And for the black white stroop task in a similar way, um, we ask children to touch the white card if we say black and touch the black card if you say white. So they're having to do something that's that's pretty counterintuitive and, and do the opposite of what's asked. So this measures inhibitory control. So we've tended to use these are really child friendly, um, engaging tasks, and they've tended to work quite well with diverse groups of three and four year olds. And what we've found over several studies now is that performance on these executive function tasks correlates with school readiness and in particular with early numeracy or math skills um, and this is quite interesting to us um, and it seems to suggest that executive functions as you might expect if you've got a child that's good at attending good at remembering information and suppressing distractions they tend to do better on tasks that require math skills so processing numbers doing sums additions counting cardinality, a range of different math skills. And what we've tended to find is that children from more advantaged backgrounds tend to score more highly on measures of executive function. So we can measure advantage through, and, and psychologists often measure this through socioeconomic status or SES. And this refers to one's access to economic and social resources and the social positioning and privileges and prestige that derive from these resources, whether that's education, so having a really high level of education, which affords um, social and cultural capital, or income, having a high level of income where you have um, stability perhaps in your job and you can afford certain resources, um, the occupation that you have or the neighborhood that you live in. So we can look at SES through lots of different lenses and often we try and get a composite score um, considering all of these factors. So just to give you a bit of context to this, um, there's been a rise in childhood poverty in the UK since 2010, and this has actually started to reverse previous downward trends. So it started to get better. Um, and I, I think this has been linked actually to uh, policy changes that were brought in by our Labour government um, in the 90s, where they really tried to invest in high quality childcare and support for families. Um, and, and that's kind of been going on a downward trend with changes in the government and changes in policy. And um, unfortunately, it's led to an increase in childhood poverty. So around 30% um, of children um, under 10 live in poverty in the UK. And in Sheffield, it's slightly higher than the national average. So 33% of children under 10 um, and around 25% of adults. So interestingly, the national statistics and the statistics for Sheffield suggest that more children proportionally live in poverty than adults and child poverty is expected to increase over the coming years. So we're living in quite social, socially unequal times. And I've been interested to try and see what the impact of that might be. And when we think about how social inequality might shape development, there's multiple correlated pathways through which social inequality might shape one's development more broadly. So when we think about development in terms of well-being, not only cognitive development, but thinking about um, one's well-being and, and aspirations and um, access to um, opportunities, there's these multiple interrelated factors. So we can think about a, a, a kind of a basic but fundamental level access to food and heating and adequate housing um, and good nutrition, access to opportunities and high quality childcare. And then we can think about these collection of kind of family related factors like cognitive stimulation, parenting knowledge and practices, social and cultural capital, and also thinking about psychosocial stress, stresses both in parents and in children. And psychologists, we tend to focus on those factors on the right, I think, um, when we're thinking about aspects of development. But it's important to also remember that they're really fundamental factors like nutrition that we often don't look at. That tends to be more what health researchers or biologists look at. But this is obviously really important as well. So multiple factors that might be playing a role in explaining how social inequality shapes development. 
And I think Bronfen Brenner's um, ecological systems model really highlights these multiple pathways quite nicely. And um, thinking about that kind of macro system um, that the culture in which we're raised and the policies and laws and traditions of that culture. Um, we can think about the exosystem, the extended family, like friends, mass media, the school that we go to in the neighborhood that we live in. And then that micro system, which is kind of more um, closely linked factors like family, um, the child's own skills and preferences um, and peers. And again, as psychologists, we often focus in on that middle part. And I think I'll come to this at the end, um, but I think it's also important to take into account the wider factors that are at play. So I really wanted to mention this model because I think it's important. So why is understanding this important? Um, well, there's lots of research now to suggest that um, gaps that are linked to inequality widen over time. So socioeconomic inequalities in development are known to be cumulative and to compound over time. So gaps tend to widen, they don't tend to stay stable. And identifying when they emerge so that we can support children early on has often been argued to be the best approach because if we think about these gaps widening over time, we need to put things in place to stop that happening. Um, and both economically, but also you know, from, from a responsibility level to the children and the families, intervening early before those um, difficulties embed and, and widen is really important. However, when we look at the literature and we think about a lot of the literature that's been done on socioeconomic status and cognitive development, a lot of the work either focuses on older children, and I think partly that's because of the measures that we have and the tools that we have, or the studies tend to use quite broad level measures of cognition, um, which really limits theory development. I think it limits our ability to really understand what's going on and the mechanisms that are at play. So some of the research that we've been, that been doing in this area, I'm going to talk about two of the studies that we've been doing um, recently. Um, so in one study, we worked with just under 200 preschoolers um, from South Yorkshire, and we tested them on various measures of executive function. And we looked at, in the UK, we have this really great tool called the Index of Multiple Deprivation, where we can get the postcode from where somebody lives and at a street by street level in the UK, all of these areas, almost 33,000 areas have been ranked according to different levels of deprivation. Um, so looking at things like the income of the area, um, employment and education, but also looking at things like the living environment more broadly. And we were able to find that just under 50% of our sample lived in 20% of the most deprived areas of the UK and 30% lived in the 20% of the least deprived areas of the UK. So for this study, our sample was very split between children that were living in very advantaged areas and children living in... And we found that socioeconomic status was related to executive functions and early math skills. So we tested children on a range of different tasks. Um, and when we think about overall executive function and create a composite latent factor, um, we found medium sized effects um, for, for SES on, ex, on overall executive function and maths. And when we break this down as well, you can see that this seems to be um, driven by influences on inhibitory control and working memory um, and less so on basic visual spatial memory, so a short term memory task. So this suggests that the tasks that are more complex in terms of the executive function demands and perhaps also language demands seem to be showing the stronger SES effects than more basic cognitive skills. So we wanted to follow this work up and we were conscious of the fact that for this study, we had to divide our sample um, in a kind of categorical fashion because when we looked at the data, around half were living in the lowest, some of the lowest, most deprived areas of the UK, and then almost half were living at the opposite end of the spectrum. So in the next study that we did, we wanted to get a continuous sample. So try and get children living in all different areas um, along the 10 deciles um, in terms of advantage and disadvantage. So I had a really great PhD student working with me, Ella James Brabham, um, and she did some work with 145 preschoolers from a range of different SES backgrounds. Um, so we had a really nice continuous score of SES in this study. And again, she replicated the finding that some of the lar largest correlations were between SES and the tasks with higher executive function and language demands. So the tasks involving inhibitory control. And we also measured language in this study and found that 
language in terms of receptive vocabulary was strongly related with SES. And again, replicating this finding that it was less so for visual spatial basic memory. So just to summarise um, this research, we also found that the socioeconomic related attainment gaps across three different studies, we found that they correlated with early mathematical skills from age three. So from as young as age three, we find that um, the disadvantaged children were performing lower on these measures of math skill. And this was quite surprising to us because again, a lot of the research has been done with older children and often finding that in terms of maths knowledge, this tends to, we tend to start to see these gaps when children start school. So around age five, six, seven, um, when children are kind of formally learning maths, because often three-year-olds are still at home with their families in the UK. Um, so this suggests that there are factors at play very early on that are influencing early math skills and how children are learning about number and shape and pattern. And um, through several different studies, we found significant indirect effects from SES to mathematical skills via children's executive functions. So this suggests that the SES gaps that we're seeing in early math skills might be partly driven by differences in executive functions. And we can imagine that there might be other influences, for example, the home learning environment. Um, we've done research on this that I'm not going to talk about today, um, but quite interestingly finding that when we look at the frequency of maths activities in the home, it doesn't have an effect. Um, but there's interesting caveats to that that I'd be really happy to talk about at the end. But for now, our biggest findings from this research seem to be that executive functions are mediating this relationship. And the knock on effect on early maths really does matter. Um, so lower SES children who begin school with less maths knowledge, um, they, this, again, this tends to widen over school. And it makes sense when we think about maths as a subject that this would happen. M learning maths is it's a cumulative subject. And so understanding those early concepts, um, basic things like counting and having a really good strong grasp of number and spatial awareness. These are foundational skills that are really important for children to go on and learn more advanced maths. So it makes sense that if children are starting out on an unlevel playing field, those gaps are just going to widen over time. So in terms of take home points from, from this section of the talk, um, our research has been finding that social inequality influences early executive function development and that lower SES children tend to score lower on measures of executive function. And we think that this has a knock on effect in early maths through executive functions um, and this is a problem because these children are going to be at a disadvantage when they start school. So given that we know that executive functions really rapidly develop in the early years and we start to see disparities really early on, how can we then best support cognitive development? So I wanted to start by just briefly talking about randomised control trials. I think that coming up with really rigorously designed randomized control trials or interventions with a control group. These are really great for testing evidence-based ways for supporting children's development and learning, but also been able to more theoretically able to be able to test causal mechanisms. So a lot of the, the work that I've just told you about is cross-sectional and longitudinal, um, and, and obviously the longitudinal work gets a little bit at, at causal relations, but not really fully because it's not fully, it's not an experimental uh, study and we're not able to fully look at causal mechanisms. So I think RCTs have been really helpful about these randomized control trials for trying to look at that and also test evidence-based ways for, for supporting children and families. And we started out thinking about this, like maybe a lot of people did in cognitive and developmental psychology who were working on this topic years ago. Um, so I think back, back maybe in 2017, there was so much positive talk that cognitive training might, um, might, might work and might help children. Um, so we wanted to test this idea um, that if we train executive functions directly, does that, that support children's development? Do we see improvements? So, um, it's, we started this study in 2017 and ran this for a couple of years because we were trying to aim for a big sample and a really rigorously designed program. Um, we designed an executive function training program for preschoolers 
that importantly had very little overlap between the train tasks and the outcome measures because we wanted to see if cognitive training would genuinely improve executive functions not just that children were getting better at, at specific tasks and um, learning to respond quickly to certain stimuli or, or certain feedback um, so we did the programme that we did in which we measured improvements, we did that before and after the programme. These tasks were very different. We made sure that they were different so we could really rigorously test this. And we tested this intervention in around 200 preschoolers um, and we were really keen to, again, get socially diverse children involved in this study. We pre-registered the study and we also followed best practice guidance, so consort guidelines for this study, um, which is kind of the gold standard for randomised control trials. We had an active control group, for example. And what we found was that while we saw improvements over training itself on the training tasks, we found no robust evidence of transfer to executive functions or math skills. So when we gave children the untrained tasks that measured the same construct, but were different tasks, we found no um, evidence that, that there were improvements on these tasks compared to an active control group. Um, and this supports a lot of recent meta-analyses that have just come out looking at whether cognitive training seems to be effective for adults and children. Um, but I guess it's still a bit of a puzzle because if executive functions and early maths are correlated, why doesn't cognitive training, where we kind of really focus on executive function directly, why doesn't it then transfer um, to early learning and executive functions as well, just at a baseline level? Um, so we started to think about this some more, and I've been really lucky to be working with um, a team of researchers at the University of Oxford, where we've been thinking about how if we want to improve executive functions and the learning activities that are associated with executive functions, perhaps we need to actually just embed executive challenge into the learning activities themselves. So the idea would be if the aim is to say improve early maths, let's think about how we can build executive challenge into early maths. Nothing that's too difficult where children would just struggle, but nothing that's too easy where children are not getting to practice. And then they start to get that kind of gradual practice at using their executive functions. And then we think that this will lead to deeper learning of maths concepts, but also help children to develop strategies to help them use maths. And, and this in turn will lead to better maths performance. So I've been working with um, Professor Gaia Sharif um, and, a, and a really great large interdisciplinary team where we've been um, working on a program called the ONE, which stands for Orchestrating Numeracy and the Executive. And we've been developing a program that embeds executive functions into early maths learning. Um, and what's really great about this program is that it's also been developed with teachers in mind. So the idea is that these activities would be done in a preschool or nursery school classroom. And so we've had a team of teachers giving us feedback on this and, and co-developing this with us to make sure that the activities will work and that they're fun and easy to actually include in the classroom. So the ONE programme aims to improve early maths by working in partnership with early years practitioners, building executive function into maths and providing children with strategies and practice using their executive functions while they're learning, which we think is really key, rather than doing this in isolation. And um, we are currently trialling this programme as, as part of um, a grant from the Education Endowment Foundation. And the idea of this programme, it's a 12 week programme. And the idea is that we also um, try and improve practitioner knowledge around executive functions and how they're able to recognise it in the classroom and recognise those opportunities to embed executive challenge into activities. So for the first four weeks of the programme, we do um, one every week, just one 30 minute um, practitioner development session where we go into the nursery, work with the early years practitioners and do a 30 minute session a week uh, where we tell them about early maths um, we tell them about what executive functions are and how, how maths and executive functions are related. And we go through different activities that um, we want to try out and see if that might support children's maths. So we do those four sessions, one a week for the first four weeks. And then teachers are asked for 12 weeks to play three different activities or games every week from a choice of 25. We've come up with 25 activities that are fun and can be used in a classroom. And practitioners pick three that they want to work with a week um, for, the, for the duration of those 12 weeks. 
Um, and then we do a check-in phone call in week eight to see how that's going and if they have any questions. And then at the end of the study, we do an informal interview with the teachers just to see how they found it and get their feedback. And in terms of the activities that we've developed, we've tried to target all different key areas of maths. So thinking about spatial awareness and shapes, patterning and order, as well as counting and numbers, which when we've spoken to practitioners, it's often counting numbers that they tend to focus on. They're really comfortable with doing the counting and talking about number, but maybe less confident on the patterning and order and spatial awareness and shapes. But we've also thought about how it can be embedded in free play activities because free play is obviously just a really important component of these informal settings when children are very young. Um, it will be quite rare to just spend the day doing quite structured activities. So uh, we try and make sure that the games are fun and, and game based. They don't take more than 10 minutes, but they also can be embedded into free play. Um, and as I mentioned, they've been co-developed with practitioners. So just to give you an idea of one of the activities that we're using, um, I don't know if you have this game in Greece or a similar variant of it called What's the Time, Mr. Wolf? So this is quite a common game that um, even, even when I was young, we would play in a classroom environment and we've kind of took this game and adapted it and, and added a numerical component to it. So the idea is, and, and this can be done in an outside space in a playground, um, one child would be the wolf and they stand with their back turned to the other children and the children stand in a line behind that child and the children ask what time is it Mr Wolf and the wolf should reply with the time so they might say five o'clock or twelve o'clock and whatever the number the wolf says the children should take that number of steps across the playground counting as they step and then when the wolf senses that the children are close enough to catch, they turn around um, and run after the children and then whoever they catch becomes the wolf. So it's a really fun interactive game, but it involves number. So children are having to count and recognize the time, um, but it also involves executive function because children are having to um, use their inhibitory control to make sure that they are not just carrying on with the game, they're monitoring who's the wolf and are they going to come running after them to make sure that they're not caught. Um, and also their working memory to maintain in mind what the number is and monitor that as they're counting their steps. Um, so a really simple, fun childhood game where we can embed executive functions um, and it's one that teachers have really enjoyed using and, and have found it works quite well in their classroom environment. So in terms of, I've talked about the programme and some of the activities that we're using as part of this programme. Um, we're currently working with around 150 nurseries around the UK to trial this programme as part of an efficacy trial funded by the Education Endowment Foundation. And the idea is that um, in autumn this year, all the schools that we've got on board, so we're currently trying to recruit these nurseries and it's the most I've ever recruited for us of the 150. It's been really interesting and challenging, but fun. Um, and, and teachers seem to be really enthusiastic about taking part. Um, we have the idea is that we get the schools on board and children would be assessed on their executive function and maths in autumn. And then in the spring, they would take part in the 12 week programme. And then the children will be assessed again to measure the change over time. And then we also have a waitlist control group. So we've got a comparison to, to schools who are just business as usual. Um, so we're really hoping to get more insight. Um, by the end of 2025, we will know if, if uh, this seems to be working and we will ha be having thousands of children taking part in this. So we'll be able to be really confident in the results. That we did a smaller feasibility study with 12 nurseries um, last year and we found some positive effects on executive function and maths but the idea is now to roll this out on a wider scale and see how the teachers are finding it but also with that having that higher statistical power to see are there genuine improvements from this program and it'll be really exciting to see if that's the case. So the take home points from this, this um, section on supporting executive function development is that I think training executive functions directly, I think we know from kind of lots of studies now, our own work and um, lots of work that training executive functions directly doesn't seem to work. Um, and the idea is we think lower SES children might be getting less practice at using executive functions in the context of learning. Um, so we're thinking that if we can try and embed executive functions into the learning activities themselves, this should be supporting children's not only their executive function, but their learning and um, stay tuned to see whether that is the case. We should know in a few years.
So I now just want to go back to thinking about SES disparities in, in executive function. I think it's good to already be thinking about how can we design interventions to support development? But then on the other hand, I think we also need more data to try and understand why do we see these disparities? On the one hand, we could intervene and try and support executive functions learning directly through the programme that I've talked about. But I also think there are these wider factors at play. And if we can try and get a more mechanistic understanding of why these disparities are happening, that will, well, one, it will help with theory development, but two, it will help us develop more well-rounded interventions um, that can, can best support families. So why might disparities arise in executive functions? The reason I think that we need more data is that actually the theories at the moment are quite limited. Um, there are two quite prominent theories at the moment that um, discuss why we might see socioeconomic disparities in executive function, but they are quite broad and quite vague. So the cognitive stimulation theory is quite promising, um, but again, it's really broad. So it just talks about this idea that perhaps higher SES children, so advantaged children, they tend to just receive more cognitive stimulation overall. They have more resources for playing, they have enriching extracurricular activities, they're read to a lot, they attend better quality daycare. And it's this combination of factors that leads to this more cognitive, cognitively stimulating environment. But what that actually means, like what does cognitive stimulation mean and why do we see specific effects on some executive function tasks but not others? Um, there's still lots of questions we need to answer. Another really prominent theory is stress models that talk about the fact that disadvantaged children tend to experience more stress, both directly, so through neural networks that underpin executive function, but also indirectly through the stress um, shaping parenting practices, both of these different factors and the stress that families might be experiencing might have a knock on effect on executive functions. Um, but this doesn't really cover other aspects of cognition like language. Um, and it also tends to focus more at the very low end. So children and families living in poverty, when we know that these, um, the socioeconomic gradient in cognition tends to be across the whole spectrum. So even very, very advantaged children, very high SES children and middle SES children, there are still these differences. Um, so we sort of need theories that can account for that variation across the whole spectrum um, and give more specific detail on the mechanisms um, and the specificity of the effects and the fact that they seem to be more on language and high level executive function tasks. So what about language? I think that language might potentially play a really important role in explaining why we see SES inequalities. So language development is um, heavily linked to input from the home environment. And there's a lot of research on language and vocabulary in particular, finding that socioeconomic status um, is quite linked quite strongly to language development. Um, and the paths for language are much clearer. So language is, um, it has really heavy input based on what you're hearing in the home. Um, the, the words that you hear and the range and the quality of the conversations um, and the language input that you're receiving will, will really have a strong impact on your own language. For executive function, it's much less clear how the home would directly shape executive functions, but perhaps there are pathways from language to executive functions. And this goes back to Vygotsky, who really kind of pioneered this idea that language and interactions play a fundamental role in high level cognition. Um, and when we think about the kinds of rich parent child interactions that we often see where parents have been responsive, particularly in situations where a child might be struggling with a task, um, you can see just these beautiful interactions where that rich language is playing out and, and responsive parenting, that back and forth where parents are helping children to develop self-regulation skills in that interaction. Um, so the idea is that language and regulation might co-develop as part of these interactions. And of course, parent sensitivity and their ability to be responsive will really vary widely as a function of a family's social and economic circumstances, their cultural norms, their preferences, but also their constraints and circumstances. So we can see how SES might have a knock-on effect on the ability for parents to be responsive and sensitive in interactions, and then that might have a knock-on effect on children's ability to develop language and, and self-regulation. And then both of those in turn might influence executive function development. 
So that's the idea. Um, but we really need more data to understand how this might be playing out. Um, so as I mentioned, I think current theories are quite broad and hard to test. And there's very little research looking at young children, which is when these disparities were already setting in. Um, so we need this more basic mechanistic work to look at early mechanisms, but also consider the broader contextual family factors that might shape parenting preferences and approaches. So I think it's probably not enough to say, um, you know, very low SES parents might be struggling to be sensitive in that interaction without actually considering why and, and the challenges that they may, may be under and also thinking about what those families are doing well under really difficult circumstances. So in this study, I'm really excited that we're running this study at the moment. It's funded by the ESRC um, and we have some really great partners on board, including our local council, BBC Learning and, and the charity Save the Children. And we're wanting to look at why inequalities emerge in cognitive development and kind of bring the strands of research that I've been talking about today together. So the toddler development and the work on SES and executive function. And then bringing my colleague, Dr. Danielle Matthews in, who's a language expert, to also consider language. And uh, Molly Jackson's the research assistant working with me on this project. So as part of this work, we're working with two to four year olds and their families to understand how executive functions and language develop and interact over time. So this is a longitudinal study where we're going to track development over time uh, from the age of two and a half up to the age of four. And we also want to understand the role that caregivers play in their development and what constraints caregivers are under as well. So not just looking at these interactions in isolation, but considering the constraints that parents are under. And we really want to look at whether we do see SES linked inequalities in executive functions. And if we do, when do they occur and why and through what pathways? So we have just been piloting for this study. So we're just getting to June. The study is going to start in June, um, so just next week. And it's an 18 month study and it's going to run from June to November next year. And we're going to be working at time one with children who are between the ages of two and a half and three. Um, and we're going to be looking at their language ability. We've got three different measures of this, and I'm happy to talk about those measures if anybody has any questions at the end um, or now. Um, we've got three measures of child executive function, and we are going to get the parents and children to engage in a play-based interaction as well, um, where they complete some jigsaws and, and play like they would at home, um, so we can derive measures of parent responsiveness and scaffolding. And then we're also going to look at broader factors that might feed into that interaction. So looking at parent mental health and social support and time pressure and just broader stress and parent thoughts around home learning. So that's wave one. And then we're going to follow these children up six months later with the same measures of language and executive function. We're also going to add a qualitative element to the questions that we ask at wave two that I'm happy to talk about again later if anybody's interested. Um, and then we're gonna follow children again six months after that. And with the same measures of a language and executive function, we're also gonna get a measure of um, parent executive function at this time point and a measure of children's school readiness to see how these factors predict school readiness over time. So in terms of the parent-child interactions, we're wanting to bring parents um, into the lab or we're going to go to their home and they're going to play with some games and then we're able to look at how that interaction is playing out um, in, in that situation and since I've become a parent I've really kind of it's really hit home how parents do um, such an important job in nurturing development and mitigating the impact of potentially detrimental contextual factors on development like poverty like housing insecurity or income insecurity um, many parents are doing an amazing job in really difficult circumstances um, and research has shown that parents who are responsive and who tune into their child's attention and talk about what their child is looking at um, often have children whose cognitive skills um, develop more quickly and we want to look at the evidence for this in a very diverse sample and look at how contextual factors shape this as well. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about the measures that we're going to use as well if people have questions. But this is our overall hypothesized model. Um, and I appreciate that this is quite quite big and there's lots of different factors. So happy to talk about this in more detail. But the kind of key take on points are that we're wanting to look at how SES 
shapes growth in executive function during this really pivotal time in development when these skills are rapidly developing between the ages of two and a half and four. And we're wanting as part of this to look at several mediating factors. So parent cognitions and how that feeds into scaffolding and parent responsiveness um, and how language as well shapes this. Um, um, we're going to ask parents about their stress, their social support, their time pressure, and also their confidence in their parenting. And then we have three different measures of language and three different measures of executive function that we're going to use at every time point. So take home points from this part of the study where I just think we need more data to understand disparities. And this is what I'm really hoping the Sheffield early year study will tell us. Um, there's obviously a combination of interrelated factors. It's not going to be a simple story about why we see disparities in early development. Um, there's going to be this combination of factors that shape um, how social inequality has this knock on effect on cognitive development. Um, but I think it's really important that we try and understand this and that we can then use this to build better models um, so that we can test these and also know where to focus our intervention efforts so that they have the most impact. So I'm just going to finish by talking about just general conclusions, but also broader issues to consider um, when working on this research topic. And that these are kind of things that I've been mulling around and it's been a really nice chance to use this talk actually as a as a way to kind of um, explain these broader issues that have been on my mind for some time. So one of the issues I think in working, working in this topic area and with this age group, and one of the things that's come up time and time again, and as I mentioned, we've been piloting this last month for this study. And the big, one of the biggest just stumbling blocks to doing this research is the fact that we just don't have really good tools to measure cognition in diverse children. So most of the measures that we have for children, children's executive function skills have been developed with white middle class children. So it's often the advantaged, you know, really advantaged families that come in to do studies um, around the world, really. Like it's the families that have the resources that are perhaps familiar with the university and research that take part. Um, and just as a consequence of that, it means that often the measures that we're using, we've been piloting several measures that they're in a paper, they've been published, and they say that they work with preschoolers, but then when we try them with diverse children, we're just getting floor effects and children are struggling to understand the instructions. Um, so I think a really big thing that's come from this is that we actually just need really good basic work on developing good tools for um, executive function that we can use with young children and from diverse families. And I really hope that over the coming years, we can, we can help with that, with some of the tools that we've been developing in our lab. But also, I think it's important and it's been something on my mind and, and seeing a few interesting studies actually crop up on this recently. Despite the challenges in measuring socioeconomic status and inequality across countries, because obviously all countries are different in their levels of social inequality and, and how much in one country would be a marker of huge advantage, but in another could be a marker of disadvantage. There's big challenges with comparing studies and we've, we've done some meta-analysis reviews and, and tried to look at SES across countries and it's just impossible because it's so hard to have measures that can be used to easily compare. But despite that, I think it's, it is important that we try and understand the nature of associations um, in various countries and contexts in terms of SES and cognitive development. And quite interestingly, there's been a couple of studies out in the last few years that suggest that this relationship between SES and executive function might not necessarily hold up across countries. And then it's quite interesting to think about why that might be. So Michelle Ellison at um, who's based in the education department at Cambridge. She did some really nice work looking at SES and executive functions. And she did a comparative study of UK children and children in Hong Kong and found that, you know, what I've been finding in my lab, these SES linked associations with executive function in the UK children, but not in the children from Hong Kong. And then it's interesting to think about why this might be. Um, and the idea that's come from this is that Hong Kong actually have some really excellent early years, high quality programs for families, and that might be mitigating the impact of disadvantage. And then another study that was published just this year looked at children in South Africa and the Gambia, and they used really well-established executive function tasks that have been normed with children from Australia. 
And they found that the children from South Africa and the Gambia didn't have lower executive functions, um, even though they were living in, in, in real disadvantage and, and were very much lower income compared to the families that were living in Australia. And um, they've proposed that this could be due to the fact that the communities that are living in South Africa and the Gambia, they have very strong community ties, lots of family support, really great extended wider support in terms of grandparents and, and, and um, other members of the community that support the child rearing. And that might, might again be mitigating any impact of disadvantage. Um, so I think that it's really important that we look at this and look at this across countries and try and understand how those different contexts um, might shape these associations, because it gives us really important clues into how policy changes or wider social support. So there's kind of wider factors that I talked about right at the beginning, how those might be um, important in mitigating the impact of inequality. And then the third point is something that's really been on my mind as well, that we just need to ensure that any work that we do that looks at disadvantaged families, and particularly work that looks at parenting styles or responsiveness, that if we do find an association with SES, that it doesn't then get published in a way where we're saying that those families are not doing a good job because those families are often doing a harder job. They're trying to parent in really difficult circumstances. Um, so trying to get away from this idea that poor parents are poor parents. There's a really nice study that came out by Cooper looking at thousands of families um, using questionnaire data in the UK and finding that the families in the very low income brackets actually scored higher on several areas compared to those in the middle income brackets. So they scored higher on things like um, having more family time, um, time playing, um, ha having like a regular breakfast and a regular routine and doing outside play and exercise. So lots of things and, and confidence in parenting as well. So lots of things that we think are kind of good attributes of parenting, um, low income families are doing actually really, really well. And I think it's important that we balance that message as psychologists of when we talk about, say, lower SES children having lower vocabulary and executive functions and maybe that's linked to families struggling to be responsive, making sure we're really careful in that messaging not to stigmatise families and, and to look at that wider context and also consider what families are doing well. And finally, um, I, I think this is an important point to sort of end on. Um, often as psychologists, we look at psychological factors and I often think that I also should be a sociologist because often the causes of inequality on development are structural and they could be reduced by government policy. And we often look at the individual child or the family, um, and we might say that certain styles of parenting and certain types of responsiveness are important, but actually a lot of the impact could be mitigated by changes in government policy. Um, and, and there's really nice evidence actually showing that rises in poverty can be linked to cuts in an, in, an investment in public services in the most deprived areas, sadly, um, in the UK. And I really like this quote by Sophie von Stumm, who's based at York, um, and she talks about the idea that while ever we hold on to the belief that the ones with merit are more deserving in society than those without, and the distribution then of resources um, goes according to reward rather than need, then early childhood inequality will prevail and together with its long term consequences. Um, and I really hope that by you know, being aware of this and the structural issues, it's still really important to do this kind of basic cognitive work that documents the effects on early cognition and also understanding the constraints that families are under in that broader context, because hopefully then we can use this work to push for more support for disadvantaged families. Um, and the thing that I would really love to see in the UK is high quality universal childcare, um, which I think would have a massive impact on mitigating these inequalities. So I'll just end then on final take home points. Um, so our work in the UK suggests that lower SES children are at a disadvantage in executive functions, and this has a knock on effect on school readiness and particularly maths. And I think we need to better understand the mechanisms that are behind this early on. Um, and I think that interventions are really useful for causally looking at things, but they need to be carefully designed both to be supportive of families and not stigmatizing, um, but also thinking about what do we want children to improve on? And, 
making sure we're not just looking at things in isolation. And in doing this work, um, being, be, it's really important to be aware of how these relations hold up across context and looking at also barriers um, and structural issues as well. Thank you so much. I just want to end on thanking um, the research team that I've been working with over the last few years. Um, and just to thank you all for listening and for your attention. Um, and I'd really love to hear any comments or questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blakey. I'm sure that everybody has already realized how passionate you are about uh, research uh, and the field. Uh, thank you for this inspiring talk, for covering so much, uh, giving us food for thought uh, to a significant degree. Uh, so, uh, George? Yes, uh, I would also like to thank you for a very inspiring talk. Oh. And I would like to give to the uh, public, to the participants, uh, the floor to ask questions if they have. Οπότε θα ήθελα να δώσουμε έτσι ένα μισάωρο περίπου σε ερωτήσεις προς την ομιλήτρια ή παρατηρήσεις ή τέλος πάντων ό,τι άλλο θα ήθελε ο καθένας να πει. Ε, Λίζα, έχεις ε, δώσει δικαιώμα να άγγεις μικρόφωνα. Ναι, ναι. ναι. Υπάρχουν κάποιες ερωτήσεις. Any questions for Dr. Blakey? Thank you for the lovely comments in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and yes, you can, you're right. Um, until we have a question uh, from someone else, may I, uh, first of all, thank you once again, Emma. Um, we have come to, to learn a lot over the last decades with regard to executive functions. Uh, the role as mechanisms of developmental change, the cognitive and social cognitive domains, yet also about the mechanisms underlying their own change and the factors that influence uh, the structure and function of the executive system and shape uh, trajectories. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, one of the um, um, factors that um, I thought about where, while I was listening to uh, the, these very interesting holistic interventions that you're now designing and um, uh, carrying out uh, is metacognition, Emma. Yeah. Uh, there are recent attempts to, to unify, for, to create a unifying framework for the study of executive functions and, and metacognition. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking whether adding a reflective metacognitive mm. component to these interventions mm. maybe would boost uh, their impact uh, mm. further. Of course, uh, there are steps that you take, I'm sure, <laughs> gradually yeah, yeah. tackling variables, but have you already thought about uh, Oh, thank you. Yeah, option? that's such a good question. Um, and I think you're right, there's been quite new and I think quite interesting new work looking at links between metacognition and executive function in the context of if children know to monitor their environment and they they're able to kind of be monitoring that and knowing when they need to use their executive functions that's really going to help um the tricky thing is I think we're working with preschoolers and it's really hard to get them to reflect on their thinking um I'd be really happy to hear anyone's thoughts who try to do this with preschoolers. Yeah. I get the impression from like five and age five and six, there tends to yes. be more chance of getting them to reflect a little bit. And I think you're right that when we're thinking about interventions for executive function, it's sort of missing a component if we don't also think about that. But with young kids, it's really hard to measure yes. that and get them to do that. Um, but definitely um, with the mm -hmm. teachers, it's it's been important. So thinking about that intervention when we're getting teachers to um, do the activities in the classroom, um, metacognition is coming out as quite important. So when we think about teachers reflecting on their knowledge and how their knowledge of executive functions is shaping what they're attending to in the classroom, that seems to be important. Um, yeah, this, this was another point I would make. Yeah. So, so, you know, the environment should also... Um, be supported in supporting uh, the executive functions. You're right about the age, but you mentioned uh, longitudinal design. Yeah. So I was yeah. I was thinking that maybe later yeah. this might yeah. be worth uh, 
are also studying mm-hmm. in combination. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, where I study at the moment, they're going up to four, but fingers mm. crossed, it'd be great to get funding to go further. I was already thinking about this. Depends on the sample size that we get. We're aiming for 250 families, but it's it's hard post-COVID. I don't know if, if anybody else is doing developmental research in the audience with children and just the climate that we're doing it in at the moment. Um, getting access to families it's it's a lot harder than it was a few years ago um so i'm just really hoping we get a big enough sample and then we'd be able to maybe follow them up a bit more um and think about adding in measures like that yeah thank you yes because taking into account developmental prioritization of cognitive abilities Mm -hmm. you know with increasing age as well as a differentiation of these functions Mm -hmm. which we all know that is uh of great interest uh might be you know worth focusing on yeah yeah thank you uh we have a question in the chat may i read it mm -hmm. Uh, the question is are there significant differences between boys and girls in the development of executive functions Mm, oh good question yeah we we don't tend to find differences in in basic cognition i know that there's some research with language suggesting that sometimes girls start to learn vocabulary slightly quicker than boys Um, But over the studies that we've done, we don't tend to find consistent differences, but it will be quite interesting in this longitudinal study to look at that more because um, we are not only going to include measures of kind of more cognitive classic executive function tasks, but a more behavioural measure as well. Um, It's one I've never used before, and it's a behavioural task called the gift wrap task. Um, It's quite fun to administer. I don't know if anyone's ever used this task where you get children to try and not peek while the experimenter is wrapping them a gift at the end of the session. And then you can you can measure, you know, are, are they able to regulate that? Are they looking? How often are they looking? Um, how often are they turning around? Um, and, I, and I don't know, maybe we will see gender differences in that with it being a more behavioural skill, but I, it, yeah, I don't know. So far we haven't with the more cognitive measures. But if I may follow uh, with this question, uh, I wonder if you would uh, expect based on theory such differences. Uh, the what, sorry? Would you expect based on the theory, would you expect to find these differences that you don't find? <laughs> I don't think there are many theories that talk about this. It's more anecdotal stuff from parents. When parents come into the lab, they are adamant that the girls are better self-regulated. Um, and we've never seen that, you know, we haven't seen that play out in the cognitive tasks. Um, but yeah, so many parents seem to have that impression, but I think that's just to do with social norms and what people expect of young girls and what people expect of young boys. Um, so that's why I think it would be interesting to see how it does play out in that more behavioral task. But I don't think that there are any theories that would that would kind of postulate that we should expect to see gender differences in that. It's more anecdotal. And this idea that girls are better at sitting and listening, but I don't know that that's necessarily true. <laughs> okay, thank you. Υπάρχει κάποια άλλη ερώτηση από το κοινό, κυρία Ραλιάκη, σε την καμερά τη. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it because I work with the, this uh, age group, preschool oh, years, I'm in the domain of language. So I was really excited with all this evidence you presented us. Thank you. Um, as I saw from your presentation, you've looked and you found relationships between language as this was measured with vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Uh, receptive, expressive, and executive functions with the three with the three tasks: uh, memory, cognitive flexibility, and uh, what was the other one? I can't remember. Um, self-regulation. Okay, self-regulation. Um, I was wondering whether you have studied uh, the relationship between language and executive function, and when you have uh, as a language measure narratives. Oh, yeah. either retellings or free narrative, because I assume that executive functions may involve and may have a relationship yeah. with yeah. language, when measured with language. Yeah. 
I think that's a really good question. Yeah, my colleague, Danielle Matthews, she's really interested in, in that, actually, because constructing a, it, constructing a narrative, it's very, comp you know, it, you can see how that would require working memory to put that together, to not include, dis be distracted, to not include irrelevant information, to think flexibly. Um, the tasks that we're using in the longitudinal study, we're going to be looking at not just receptive vocabulary, but also how children are using language in a naturalistic interaction with their caregiver so we're going to look at how much they're talking to their caregiver during that play-based interaction to try and get a more naturalistic measure of language because the receptive vocabulary measures I just think it tells us something but it doesn't tell us much um it tells us you know what's been transmitted maybe but not not how they're using language um and we've got a measure called the early years repetition battery which requires children to repeat to repeat sentences um, so it's not narrative. And again, I think that's because the three and four years that we're working with at the moment, and especially with them being from quite diverse backgrounds, they're already struggling just to repeat sentences. And I don't know whether that's, yeah, perhaps that's kind of normal for, for that age and, and being a diverse sample, but there's perhaps also a COVID impact. I'm really aware that we're working with COVID parents as well, and the children have been relatively isolated at this point. Um, so I think maybe looking at narratives later down the line as the kids get older could be interesting. Um, but for now, I think that could be too challenging. But yeah, it's an interesting idea that executive functions would would relate to that. And also pragmatic aspects of kind of conversational turn taking. So I'd be keen to look at that as the study, study progresses. And I'm excited that we've got these parent-child interaction videos where we can kind of pull pull these different measures out from that. In a more, and it's not ideal, it's not, you know, it's not just taking a snapshot of their interaction as they would be doing at home. They're still in the lab or they're at home, but with a set of toys for five minutes, but it's still better, I think, than just relying on a standardized measure. Okay, thank you. So we will be waiting for the results. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to ask something, if I may. I find the, the whole presentation very interesting. M many points, just uh, uh, broad questions in my mind. But I would like to, uh, to ask the one that is uh, more uh, pronounced in my head. I was wondering if this uh, knowledge that you have over all these levels of influences, if it affects the way you are parenting your children, <laughs> which I liked a lot that you brought them the discussion. So. Kind of shout it to me, I should ask this. Oh, I love that question. Yeah, I love that question. Do you know what? I genuinely think that I don't like I think I think because I'm looking at um families that are often in extreme disadvantage, and when we think about the effects as well, like I think good enough parenting, it's really important to put out this idea to parents that being a good enough parent is enough. And I find that really reassuring to think that actually children just need love they need a, you know warmth and cuddles and um you know but you know and then you've got the you've got the cherries on top you know you've got the basics like you know they need food and they need warmth but then I think that additional layer is just being a warm and open parent um and actually I would have thought that doing the research that I do I would really push the learning of stuff but you know, I really see that you don't have time often to do this with parenting young children. And I think, yeah, trying to read when you can. I try and do a bedtime story every night. Um, but I think the most important thing is to um, just love your kids. <laughs> and so I try, I'm, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I think when I do this work, we get a lot of parents in the lab asking, like, have you got parenting advice? And I think just trying to take the pressure off parents and say, you're already doing a really hard job and um, times are difficult. And just maybe like, if you want to, you know, just love your kids. And if there's any extras you want to do, maybe try and read to them, do a little bit of number stuff if you can, but you know, just do what you can with the resources that you've got. Yes, thank you. Emma, if I may add, as this might seem uh, relevant, might be relevant. Um, so you're focusing on low SES uh, uh, families and their children mostly. Um, and I was thinking, what about, you know, hot executive functions? What about um, and tackling the levels of stress, uh, ways, ways to, to deal with that, not only at, uh, uh, focusing on children, but also mm -hmm. working with the parents, as you have just mentioned, 
yeah. uh, that. Yeah. Uh, because as we are uh, studying the influence of SES, which is a rather ill-defined you know, yeah. variable, and we, you need to, to identify the mediators, actually, of yeah, this yeah. relationship with executive yeah. functioning and uh, cognitive development more generally or academic uh, skills. So what about that? What about uh, this aspect of, mm. of, uh, of the system? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I've got a clinical student who I'm working with, actually, that's that's really keen to add in some measures of stress and try and understand that a little bit more in this study. And it's been really nice working with her on what scales might be best. And we've come up with a collection of scales looking at general life stress but also psychological distress to try and tease apart parents that might have general day-to-day -day stresses that impact on their parenting but then the difference between parents that are experiencing you know real genuine psychological distress as a result of mental health um, but then also asking questions around time pressure because um and maybe that's just because I feel that time pressure as a parent and I really want to look at it in other parents but I think parents are often so time pressured and so the time that you get to engage in these kind of really responsive interactions it's, it's so limited uh, so I want to look into that as well and look at how how that varies among families from different um, socioeconomic backgrounds and there is a lot of research to suggest that things like stress might have more of an impact on hot executive functions than cool executive functions and so this is why I've included the gift wrap tab or we're, we're piloting it at the moment it might not work we're going to try it we've been just this last week um so I, i'll be i'll be sitting down with my researchers next week to look at that data um but yeah i was keen to try and have more kind of cool executive function tasks that I, that i know are reliable and valid but also include a kind of a broader measure that can look at self-regulation or hot ef and the gift wrap taps wrap tasks seemed ideal because we can just tag it onto the end of the procedure and it only takes a couple of minutes but potentially is quite a nice measure to get mm -hmm. so it'll be exciting to see how that plays out yeah okay. uh, we have one more question in the chat um, is there one executive function that is more pivotal than the others and can promote the development of the others Oh, wow. What a question. I think this would really depend on 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 what you mean by important. And um, yeah, if, if you mean by if you were thinking about what executive functions might be important in explaining early maths, I think different researchers would have different ideas um, about that. And perhaps that changes over time as well. So I like to think of working memory as a kind of really solid starting point for executive function that maybe underpins a lot of other executive functions, because in order to be able to inhibit or flexibly adjust your attention, you need to have a good, strong working memory to update your goals, remember your goals. Um, so I think working memory, and actually there's some researchers that just consider working memory as the executive system in and of itself. Um, but I think as if we're thinking, say, about the role of executive functions on learning, um, some researchers have proposed, for example, that working memory is important in the early years, but then it shifts and becomes more about in inhibition as children have to like switch between different maths operations. Um, so it sort of depends on the domain and the developmental stage. Um, but yeah, what, what a great question. Can I ask one more if there's no other yeah, uh, possibility? Yeah. It's, it's also related to you. Sorry, I'm, uh, I was working in therapy for years, so uh, yeah. personal stories are very interesting for me. Uh, if I understood correctly, you started uh, studying toddlers before you got your own children. So I was wondering what, uh, why you found it so interesting as an age group. Yeah, before I even had kids, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like, I couldn't believe like the concept of perseveration, to be honest. Like when I learned that, that children can just perseverate where you give them a task, you give them a different task and you see what they do and they can just repeat that. Like, and when you watch that behavior playing out, it literally like you can't believe it before your eyes that the kids are just not it's almost like they've just zoned out and they are just repeating this no longer relevant behavior 
and I sort of it sort of reminded me of when I lose my keys and I keep looking in the same place for my keys <laughs> and I'm not updating my behavior and I'm not it's yeah I think even adults perseverate but it was just so striking to see that and when I started testing children and seeing that they perseverate um yeah it, it seems like a, a really interesting behavioral phenomenon to look at and then we were went thinking about toddlers and well would toddlers just perseverate because if this is the lowest form of behavior on an executive function task that we know of what are toddlers doing and then it turns out that there's an even lower form where you're just unsystematic and you're not even able to remember that prior representation and have that guide your behavior you're just unsystematic when you're required to be flexible um and yeah that was absolutely fascinating and i did have to bring my th three-year-old in to do some piloting for this today and she perseverated and i was like <laughs> so interesting to see your own child like doing a switching task and just perseverating and, and she's right she's three so she's right in the perfect age bracket to perseverate and then it's really funny because when we're when we've been working with the families on these tasks, because we're working in the lab, the families are there, they're in they're in the room, and they often get very panicky about it. They see their child just doing it wrong, and they get very worried. So it's nice to be able to say, actually, this is completely normal, and my own child did this, and um, we totally expect this at this age. Um, but yeah, I think the concept of perseveration is fascinating. But perhaps what two year olds do is even more even more fascinating. Thank you. One more question. Uh, if there are no other questions. So Emma, um, and we, we all realize how uh, and see how fascinated you are by this uh, a relationship of SES with uh, executive functions and early cognitive development. So taking a step further, which lines of research do you think uh, would be worth pursuing in the future? What, what is there uh, that we still, you know, should investigate and explore and prioritize maybe? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think, um, so the study I'm doing at the moment is like my dream study It's one I've been wanting to do for ages, a longitudinal study looking at development over time. But I think the next step after that would be trying to develop really good, reliable measures of cognition from infancy right the way through to the preschool period, or, or maybe that's too ambitious, but certainly from the early toddler years to preschool years, we just don't have enough tools to measure cognition reliably. And so when the toddler years is just this black box, like I said, it's just, we, we, we know we're starting to know about language development and it may be basic attention during this time, but there's clearly so much going on. And I'd love to spend a bit of time developing tools to look at that. And then the second thing would be doing some qualitative work with families. Um, so I had a child during the pandemic and on and had a few academic friends who also had a child during that time. And on the back of that, we decided to do a qualitative study looking at how the, the pandemic had shaped parenting and um, parents' experiences of pregnancy and birth and the postnatal period. And it's been such a rewarding project to work on, maybe because of my personal interest. Um, but I'd never done qualitative research before and it made me really see the value actually in getting that rich data from parents to understand the context and the things that they're experiencing. And I think quantitative data can tell us a lot. It can tell us about trends over time, but actually um, I think having a kind of in combination with some qualitative data from families and particularly families that are underrepresented in research. So families living in poverty or very low SES backgrounds just to find out what their experiences are of, of having young children and how they're finding parenting, I think would be really valuable. So mixed methods. Yeah, right? mixed methods, yeah. Okay. Yes. So we guess if there are- Collaborating on that across country, get in touch. <laughs> there any other questions? No? So thank you so much, thank you. Emma. Thank you so much for being here, for accepting our invitation, for giving this really interesting and inspiring a talk with regard to early cognitive development. It has been a pleasure. Um, Yorgos, 
Ε, ευχαριστούμε και όλα το, τα άτομα που συνδεθήκατε σήμερα για να παρακολουθήσετε την ομιλία αυτή. Uh, many thanks to everybody who uh, got connected to uh, follow this uh, very interesting talk. Και ανυπομονούμε να σα δούμε σε επόμενε εκδηλώσει μα. We look forward to see you in other uh, things that we organize. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ όλου που ήταν εδώ. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your work. Good luck with your research. <laughs> thank you. All thank the you. best. Bye. Thank you so much. You have so many thank you comments in the oh, chat. <laughs> really kind. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for your lovely comments. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. All the best.